I V M. Hey Raghavi, have you watched the documentary Icarus? Yes, I have. Have you watched it? <laughs> no, but I figured you would have. Can you want to tell our listeners about it? <laughs> <laughs> what a scam artist! Okay, so Icarus is a 2017 documentary film. It's about the filmmaker Brian Fogel. Okay, and he wanted to sort of see what it would be like to take performance-enhancing drugs, and he wanted to win like this small-scale cycling race. And he did that. He was like, "Let's go see how it's done. How do you get them into your system?" Blah blah. Instead, he sort of accidentally chanced upon this massive conspiracy in Russia to have their mm. athletes sort of doping like crazy to be able to win mm. medals and in international competitions. Oh, wait, wait. This is like like international athletes. I mean, from Russia. Yeah, exactly. How how do they do that? How do they get? Oh, they just right. So they just switched up the athletes' pee. with someone else's p. Yeah, can you imagine having a job? <laughs> yeah, the susu switcher. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know what? If it pays well, you should take any job. What if this job of a p switcher comes with benefits? You get full medical and your family also gets it. Or better yet, I don't know, life insurance, a free phone, you get a work phone, I don't know. Oh, good god. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why women don't do more crime? Well, we're here to tell you. There's misconduct all the time. Women are thieves and murderers. That's gross misconduct. Con artists, money launderers. Mm, criminal misconduct. Financial fraud that's hard to track. Take some planning, but still misconduct. Even breaching a contract. Well, that's more civil, though. It's misconduct. Misconduct. We tell you all about women that suck. Things that make you say, "What the?" It's misconduct. Hello, 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 and welcome to Misconduct. We are a podcast about Indian women that did some bad, bad things. In our last episode, we sort of told you to expect something depressing for the next episode. But you know what? It's the new year. It's 2022. We still have some sense of hope, although heavily misplaced. So we figured we'd bring you something a little chirpier than that. My name is Raghavi, and I am Nisha. And today we are talking about a series of female Indian athletes that were either alleged to have used banned substances in competitive sports or mm-hmm. punished for it. In some cases, they were punished after they had won a medal in the competition, which led to a lot of drama. The women that we are talking about are Ashwini Akunji, Mandeep Kaur, Sini Jos, Jana Murmu, Tiana Mary, and Priyanka Panwar. Six athletes that received a two-year ban in 2011 for using anabolic steroids. Mm-hmm. They appealed the decision, which was reviewed again by the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which upheld the ban. Duti Chand. India's first professional sprinter from the LGBTQ+ community. Uh she has openly come out as well, mm-hmm. who tested positive for high levels of testosterone in 2014, making her ineligible to compete as a female athlete. So, this is a slightly more complicated case, uh one that intersex advocates across the world have condemned. She instead fought her case with the Court of Arbitration for Sports and won. Mm-hmm. So, this was like removing her from suspension from competition and also paving the way for many many female athletes to bypass a ridiculous hormone based eligibility criteria. Good stuff. And the last athlete that we'll be talking about is Nirmala Shiyoran. She received a 4-year ban from the Athletes Integrity Unit for the presence of two performance enhancing drugs in her system. She received this ban in 2019. Dude, you know I'm particularly interested in learning about how this works at all, okay? Cuz you know we know what doping is. We know it's a big no-no in the competitive sports community. Um but what we might not know really is just how prevalent it is today, especially cuz mm. you know like there are so many sophisticated methods of doping that sort of come up every day in fact yeah. it's almost like an industry in itself you know and mm. there are like teams like of people just working across the world to mm. supply non detectable methods of you know introducing supplements into athletes diets and their bloodstream and everything and mm. Mm. i know this could probably be as an unpopular opinion but i want to say let them dope bro cuz like <laughs> yeah cuz just think about it okay 
would it be really cool to see the fittest athletes in the entire world all strong and attractive and like the peak of their competitive years and they all get the same dope and then they just go nuts on the track or field or whatever it's like just like peak like almost non human performance for our entertainment <laughs> You know, I never pegged you for one of those people who would uh, create the Hunger Games, but <laughs> here we are. I guess you you sound like that one guy who is like, "Oh, X Men, don't be afraid. We will not treat you badly. I will create safe <laughs> space for you." But then, aha, slavery for profit and entertainment. <laughs> okay, not slavery. Okay, but I'm just mm. saying, like, you would pay good money to see, you know, people. on like a secret science juice that makes them fast and strong and ruthless and stuff on that note this podcast is not suitable for children mm-hmm. i'm not sure why because i guess cheating is bad cheater <laughs> cheater what is the thing that anjali says rahul is a cheater but that's very specific yeah, so to rahul what... if you're a kid named rahul you're not allowed to cheat that's it <laughs> <laughs> but yeah generally cheating is bad so children don't listen to this podcast also mm-hmm. adults uh, because rahul was an adult when he pretended to be a child playing <laughs> basketball on the court uh, adults listener discretion is advised so nisha do you want to set mm-hmm. some context first today yes please okay let's do it so let's try to understand doping first okay hmm. we know it but let's just get a little more technical about it so doping <laughs> refers to when a professional athlete takes certain performance enhancing drugs or substances hmm. well to enhance their performance in competitions so rahul is a cheater yes it's literally that so they're like <laughs> there are many different ways you can take them sometimes they're ingested directly they're taken as supplements you know you can shoot them into your blood stream sometimes they're also hidden with mm. other substances to sort of make them undetectable and there's a reason that people go through the effort to make it undetectable because across the world there is a uniform set of basic guidelines that's followed by every you know athletic organization and it's called anti doping agencies so mm. it there's, there's a code of sorts that they all follow uh this code has been put together by the world anti doping agency or the wada just remember this name for later it'll come up quite a bit yeah. um the wada is assisted by individual anti doping organizations in each country so you know the american one is the usada the uk one is called the ucad for australia it's called asada like things like that so just add ada like ada at yeah. the end of your country's initials <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so is the indian one called A- ayada oh no no sorry it's No, it's actually called NADA. It's the oh. national, yeah, it's the national anti-doping agency. Ooh, can you imagine for like a country that starts with T, it will be TADA. Uh huh. I like NADA only. It's cute. NADA is cute nice. Only. It is cute. But yeah, so basically, it's this like you know very closely regulated, monitored sort of global set of standards, and they all hmm. follow those standards because that's just what they've all agreed to. Yeah, and testing is done to find the markers of any prohibited substances used. Mm-hmm. Uh one such common substance used is the anabolic steroids. They have a lot of medical uses but they're also very effective in assisting bone growth, stimulating appetite, inducing male puberty and increasing muscle mass and physical strength. And what happens when you have more muscle mass and strength than your competitors? You win all the competitions and yes, <laughs> you you bag top place, you get all the fame, all the pride for your country and all the sportswear endorsements of course. Um, yes. And the thing is, like, there are some other, there are many kinds of banned substances. Anabolic steroids is just one of them. They also include, you know, basic street drugs, stimulants, um, peptide hormones like, you know, the human growth hormone, uh, alcohol, even beta blockers, diuretics, anti-estrogens, and gene manipulation. What even? Like, not even alcohol. I yeah. don't you think like after these, like, winning a big thing, you'd pop a bottle of champagne and aha, how do they even celebrate? No, you just immediately go to the next event. Oh my god! Alternatively, you eat a donut, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> But now, as Nisha said, testing does happen, um, and in most cases, the markers of these substances can be detected in biological samples, usually, you know, urine and blood. That's just the easiest way to mm-hmm. check for these. Um, and these anti-doping agencies, so they've taken really extraordinary steps to ensure that prohibited substances are not used by competing athletes. So. Mm-hmm. there is of course a testing mechanism and it's really elaborate i will sort of condense it for you based on what we know from the uh, you know the wada code so mm-hmm. testing is carried out in accordance with the wada code as well as a series of international standards on how to test for different kinds of substances so broadly there is the wada and there are regional and national agencies also 
and they will have something called a doping control officer which is a dco so yeah. the dco what he or she does is just sort of handles the entire process of doping testing so it comprises of five steps overall uh, that includes selection of an athlete for you know testing uh, notification of that athlete sample collection sample analysis and results management so okay an athlete sort of gets picked for testing and it can happen in like one or two ways it can happen in competition uh, which is basically is a bunch of criteria which includes you know random selection when the athlete finishes in that competition you know or if they have received a verifiable complaint in those cases you can have testing done within a competition itself um ordinarily you can test out of competition and that can happen literally anywhere anytime and you don't get advance notice and when i say you don't get advance notice what i mean is the dco will just turn up at the location information you've given and say yo i'm the dco i need to test you and of course the dco has to properly identify themselves so the athlete knows you know it's them yeah i was just wondering like if anyone can just walk up to your nearest competitive athlete's house and be like <laughs> gib p <pee." laughs> that sounds like don't talk about that it sounds like a market that somebody would want so let's keep it on the oh down low <laughs> also dude what the hell like Yeah okay I also thought the same thing okay I thought I'll give you some <laughs> shit for it but I thought the same thing I was just like can I just walk up and find and just ask an athlete can you give me your P and will they give it um but then no I oh. looked that up and I realized that the DCO has to show their ID and stuff and then the athlete signs a form basically saying I can tell you know, like I consent to the testing etc mm. so after they notify the athlete must immediately report to the doping testing center and there are some cases where the athlete can ask for a later time like if they have to compete immediately or mm. if they have a press conference or you know like a contractual arrangement if they need medical treatment those sorts of things yeah that sounds like a loophole <laughs> yeah it, it could be depending on how you want to look at it but um mm. yeah so upon notification though the dco will always be with the athlete till the testing process has been mm. completed So the athlete selected will be asked to provide one or more urine and blood samples. When the athlete is ready to provide the sample, an officer of the same gender will be present to watch you provide that sample. Okay, that is that is so humiliating. Uh mm-hmm. also did you mean of the same gender or sex? Uh I mean sex, but the WADA website says gender and I mm. feel like that it's in itself is an indicator to figure out, you know, that these that doping testing might not really understand gender identity overall and also mm-hmm. how comfortable athletes would be with this process right uh, the athlete also has to divide the samples into a and b bottles for mm-hmm. independent and separate testings mm-hmm. so these samples then go to the wada laboratory uh, sample a is tested first sample b is put away so that they can test it later in case sample a comes up with any positives mm-hmm. so sample b is kind of like a confirmation for the result mm-hmm. now lastly the results The lab reports the result to the anti-doping organization that the athletes fall under. A copy of these results are sent to the WADA as well. If the findings are not in the athlete's favor, they do have some rights, uh, and this includes getting a fair hearing and a right to an appeal. Right. So, also, I know this sounds very elaborate, uh, but there's a reason, you know, like a good reason why testing regulations exist. In fact, they provide sort of a uniform set of doping-related regulations across the world, and the idea is to help place all athletes at a level playing field. Of course like Nisha yeah. said earlier they don't really understand even gender identity so is it really that uniform yeah. yeah there are several issues we'll get into that actually as we look at each of the women that we'll be talking about today mm. um but this this is what the intention was even if it's not necessarily you know practiced that way right right um so as ragavi had mentioned the anti doping code is the mother of all anti doping regulations mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it outlines the wada's anti doping policies rules and regulation with sports organizations and it also covers the public authorities around the world mm-hmm. so more than 660 sports organizations have signed the wada code including the international olympic and paralympic committees and athletes sign and accept the wada code every time that they give their samples for testing which is why if they fail it they are bound to abide by the penalization rules as well uh-huh. now what happens if an athlete fails a test so the punishment can include in if you have won a particular event that was influenced by the substances that you tested positive for your results could be disqualified including forfeiture of all the medals and the prize money which is kind of sad but it gets sadder yeah. uh, you could be banned from all sport usually mm-hmm. up to 4 years but sometimes there are some lifetime bans as well 
and when we say all sport it means everything competing training and coaching mm. basically there is no way you can get any commercial use out of your best years as an athlete third is the public display of your doping violations which i think raghavi had a chance to view some of the uh, violations that you know of the women that we're going to be talking about today mm-hmm. they're really complicated by the way it's not like uh, yeah. it's really scientific so i didn't understand chunks of it and also the code <laughs> is quite massive okay like i don't know enough about competitive sport to know mm. the specifics um you're free to read it is it all publicly available on the wada websites but uh, it's a lot for like you know a rookie basically yeah actually if there's any athlete who would like to explain it to us we will mm-hmm. let you know our instagram <laughs> handles yeah. at the end of the episode please do reach out to us cuz this is actually this is one of those episodes that we don't fully understand because we <laughs> yeah. don't know the nuances of being an athlete so so yeah um oh uh, and the last punishment uh oh, is yes. that mm-hmm. there could be some financial penalties as well yeah but by that point you're banned from sport everyone's like publicly berating you and yeah. you know you your medals are gone there's nothing left to take Everything. from you man don't take his money also i swear you can't yeah. it's come to a point where you can't even say sport without someone being like hey yeah. <laughs> so yeah now remember these are athletes that we're talking about even like a few months off of their training can lead to a very very quick drop in their career mm-hmm. also these violations attract a lot of negative press it is yeah. insane because the thing is uh, especially in india the kind the press attention that you get if you're an athlete and you win something big for the country it's like they will get into all of the details of your life starting from which color toothbrush you had to you know <laughs> to to like whatever that you love the most and uh, because yeah. they have to make a big deal out of it and then all of that when you get caught mm-hmm. it just becomes quite sad so yeah. imagine all of that negative press so even if you try to make a comeback after your ban it is it might be very difficult uh, to convince sponsors to support right. you right right unless they have a really great pr machine that can sit mm. and remove everything <laughs> um, even true. to get endorsements and stuff and stuff will be like uh, or, or like commercial deals and stuff like that would be very yeah very and as you mentioned the pr of the stuff is really important as well right yeah it is it's just athletes that are even just alleged to have doped often can get super brutalized by the media channels and social mm-hmm. media platforms to the point where sometimes it can be enough to end their career even before actual test results are verified and the athletes are given time to contest the findings as well i mean forget the media social media is is just an entire battleground that plus most of these athletes are quite young mm-hmm. so attacking them it's it's kind of sad it is a tough position for them to be on yeah don't attack 16 year olds man it's just so stupid yeah yeah and oh by the way there's one thing i want to focus on very quickly here so uh, and this is important for the women that we'll be discussing as well uh, the wada doping code provides for something that's called the principle of strict liability so this is actually a very common term that's used in legal claims such as tort claims which are basically mm. you know civil cases that you make claims for for monetary compensation so mm. the concept of strict liability basically means in this context that each athlete is liable for the substances that are found in their body irrespective of the intent and i got this from wada's own website okay so let me quickly read it out to you an anti doping rule violation occurs whenever a prohibited substance is found in bodily specimen whether or not the athlete intentionally or unintentionally used a prohibited substance or was negligent or otherwise at fault what that yeah. makes no sense except it kind of does so there are millions of sports persons out there okay and it's really hard to regulate what they put in their bodies you physically can't do it so the wada kind of has to shift the responsibility entirely on the athletes so but what if like you don't even know if some substance is banned or something or like if the rules just randomly change well then it just sucks to be you <laughs> cuz like what? this yeah so now that you mentioned this happened to maria sharapova as well we know her as the russian tennis player with multiple grand slam titles and of course she's an yeah. olympic medalist as well right so she was banned um from play for 15 months for a drug that she was taking part of her medication for almost 10 years and then she ended up not knowing that it was banned that particular mm-hmm. year so her original ban was actually 2 years and it was just slightly reduced because her appeal found that she had used it unintentionally and you would think if she had used it unintentionally then she would be allowed to compete again but that didn't happen yeah. 
Oh man. But mm-hmm. you know I feel like this would happen only because she is Maria Sharapova because yeah. she has money and a legal team and like enough of an image in the public to you know get through this. It would just suck if you're an athlete without any of these resources. That is correct. And on that note, why don't we get into some of the women of the day? Okay, let's start with the six women that competed in track. These were Ashwini Akunji, Jana Murmu, Mandeep Kaur, Priyanka Panwar, Sini Jose, and Tiana Mary Thomas. These women came from different parts of India and all participated in track relay. Ashwini is from Karnataka, Mandeep from Haryana, Jana from Orissa, Priyanka from Uttar Pradesh, and Sini and Tiana from Kerala. These women also had many different backgrounds. Ashwini, for example, came from a family that had a sporting legacy. The rest of them, not so much, but they just kind of made it work for them. Like uh, Sini had a job in the railways, and she chose to be a sports person instead. So they were all just a different bunch of women, but they all had a common aspiration. And it's safe to say that these women were fast and strong, mm-hmm. and at the peak of their physical strength back in early 2010s. In July 2011, the group was expected to participate in the Asian Athletic Championships in Kobe, in Japan. Right prior to this, Ashwini tested positive for anabolic steroids, and she was dropped from the team immediately and suspended from athletics indefinitely till the results could be verified again. Mm-hmm. The same thing happened one by one with Mandeep, Sini, and then the rest. And by late 2011, the athletes were all individually and collectively part of a female athlete-specific. doping scandal that was just killing it with the media mandeep tested positive for the anabolic steroid methane dye known and stanozolol ashwini priyanka sini and joanna tested positive for methane dye known tiana tested positive for epimethane diol now this was a scandal for many reasons of course this had severe implications on the trust that foreign sporting committees could place on india as a participating country india's track team was using a ukrainian coach yuri ogorodnik he trained six of the eight athletes who ended up testing positive that year and all six of these women were in his coaching team so the sports minister ajay makin was quick to act He condemned the doping instances. He said he would probe the issue right away with the National Anti-Doping Agency or the NADA. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said, and I quote, "We are removing Ogorodnik immediately, and we are also considering removing other foreign coaches." Mm. He also said, "The athletes have disgraced the whole nation, and it's very disturbing for us. Athletes will get their punishment in the form of suspensions, bans, and losing their medals. But we can't let the coaches and any official involved in this episode." get away scot free what dude this <laughs> happened under your watch under <laughs> coaches and teams that you appointed and set up you couldn't keep a tab on it and now it's Correct. literally everybody's fault except for yours how convenient mr markin this sounds like every ceo ever so yeah i didn't mean it <laughs> i just wanted to tell her her clothes were cute oh oh my goodness yeah. only 900 people will lose their job Oh. But I'm sad about it. <laughs> yeah. Disgusting. Now so each of these women of course they all had something to say about this. Thankfully they weren't silent so we know the other part of the story as well. Um mm. Mandeep who was the most vocal one of the group, she said that the steroids must have made it into their systems through tainted food supplements. Unfortunately mm. this has never been proven. Uh Jauna also made the same claim to the press specifically. So the director of the Athletics Federation of India ML Dogra he said and I quote both the athletes had written to the committee to test the vitamin food supplements and the panel will decide on it. If the panel wants the test can be conducted at the National Dope Testing Laboratory or any other government laboratory. Now sure they were tested etc or it is this is just a very general claim that they made that they would do it but Mandeep was really angry about this and she sort of remained firm on her stance throughout this entire ordeal and let me quote what she said about this okay i am in the international register testing pool of wada after asian games and i'm not a mad person that i would take steroids to enhance performance steroids remain inside the body for 3 months and how can any athlete in the international testing pool take drugs we can't win medals at international level without taking food supplements so i suspect the vitamin supplements we took created the problems We don't have a doctor and we don't know which drug can create problems. We ourselves can't become doctors. I want supplements to be tested on whether they contain steroids. I'm sure I will come out clean and I hope that I'll be given a chance to return to athletics. But do you remember what we said earlier about 
strict liability in doping issues mm. yeah yep. so that would come to bite them in the ass unfortunately so oh. in december 2011 after extensive investigations and testimony from each of the athletes the national anti doping agency of india banned each of the athletes from competition for a whole year so this disqualified their winnings in multiple competitions prior to which included the 4 by 400 meter uh, relay at the delhi commonwealth games and the guangzhou asia where they won gold medals the women appealed the decision immediately and it sort of went all the way up to the international bodies the international association of athletics federation and the court of arbitration for sport oh good i i hope they got some justice out of it oh you sweet so much child it actually got worse for them unfortunately oh. yeah so the the court of arbitration for sport didn't set aside their ban as they had expected instead mm. they decided to make it a two year ban oh man yeah they basically said nada was not strict enough on them oh ouch. and the appeal just really just slapped them in the face so essentially from june july 2011 their ban was made effective and do the two year ban for athletes is a really huge deal okay that's yeah two years you can't train you can't coach of course you can't compete even if you want to train no coach would take you on because mm-hmm. they wouldn't want to be caught in the middle of all of that and all of this is very reputation specific it is word of mouth at the end of the day so mm-hmm. coaches will be very very careful and the weirdest part of all of this is all of these drugs are actually very common and very easily testable So what Mandeep said sort of really stuck a chord with me because mm. it's a very basic set of drugs that people test for. So mm. people or sports persons generally wouldn't take these specific drugs for performance enhancement because they will definitely test positive. So mm. in fact by the early 2000s doping had become so sophisticated. There were teams and coaches actively trying, you know, to find new drugs, ways to introduce them into the athlete systems all by making sure there wasn't a positive test you know eventually mm-hmm. and do the list of banned substances gets updated every few months because that's how quickly compounds are being found to cheat the system mm. so for six of india's most revered female athletes of the time were they really stupid enough to take such a common anabolic steroid yeah as the kids say it that's super sus <laughs> gen z gen z listen to us <laughs> Uh, also it appears that the athletes were not even fed supplements from the campus of the National Institute of Sports right. in Patiala that's where they were living and training reports say that the athletes were brought food supplements from outside the campus and that their coach was keeping a track of it so seriously what the hell happened whose fault is it really unfortunately it's going to remain the athlete's fault um i'm not saying it the wada doping code says it it's yeah. just strict liability all the way you know you have banned drugs that are in your body oh you don't know where they actually came from are you as bamboozled as we are well too bad sucks to be you take a ban and that's mm-hmm. how they really work you know and you know the worst part of all of this is how the indian government reacted to this finally they just mm-hmm. dismissed it okay without giving a second thought um, so ml dogra the afi director i mentioned earlier this is what yeah. he said in an interview he said we have withdrawn the tainted athletes from the squad for the asian athletics championship although we are concerned about the rate at which our athletes are failing dope tests nobody is indispensable and we have athletes who can replace them that is so absolutely unfair okay yeah. also to make a statement like oh we have athletes who can replace you man we really don't yeah. because it's so rare for an indian family to come out and support a dream like that especially if it's something other than cricket like oh god <laughs> yeah. forbid plus mm-hmm. also as a country we don't have the best opportunities provided equally you know to all kids in, in all like strata so what i'm trying to say is you know athletes are not engineers you can't replace them <laughs> that's wow i think it's going to go to a place you would be like give a deep impassioned speech but whatever <laughs> but you know who is not replaceable these lovely mm. shows on ivm that are here to advertise hey. So let's take a quick break and when we come back uh we talk about Duthi Chand and her conflicts with the Olympic Committee. Are you looking for finance products and services that can enhance your personal finance experience? Are you looking for a space to talk about your financial product or service? And are you looking for a crisp talk show where the conversation is all about money? Well, your search ends here. Hi. My name is Anupam Gupta and I'm host of the Paisa Paisa podcast and I invite you for the conversation about your personal finance on each Monday 
on the IVM Podcast app or the website or on any podcast streaming platforms. See you folks. Welcome back from the break, everyone. We have given you a lot of dope about doping. <laughs> 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 uh, also about how some female athletes, unfortunately, fell prey to the uh, dope, to the standards. I don't know. Uh, but now we will be talking about a unique case. So mm-hmm. at the outset, the case of Duti Chand is a little different from your classic doping scandals. Duti was born on 3rd February 1996 in the state of Orissa. Her family was living for a while below the poverty line and she barely made it to school most days. However, Duti was well-read and exceptionally gifted as an athlete as well. When she was young, she once said that her inspiration was Saraswati Chand, her older sister, who was also running at the state level. In 2006, both girls got the opportunity to enroll at the local government sports hostel, which is mm-hmm. where like some super hardcore training started. Mm-hmm. In 2012, at the age of 16, Duti had become a national under-18 champion when she hit a personal best of 11.85 seconds in the 100-meter track event that year. That's crazy. 11 mm-hmm. seconds to just to run 100 meters. That's I swear. But 11 seconds is all it takes for me to fall asleep. So maybe I too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so she qualified for the 2013 Asian Athletics Championships in Pune and the 2013 Youth World Championship held in Ukraine. She won the bronze at the Pune Championship and she made it to the finals in the Ukraine one. The Ukraine achievement would actually make her the first Indian to reach the finals of a global athletics 100-meter track event, which is pretty cool. Good on her. Mm -hmm. Later in 2013, in Ranchi, at the National Senior Athletics Championship, she set Mm -hmm. a career best record of 23.72 seconds in the 200-meter event and a separate 11.73 uh, seconds time for the 100 meter mm-hmm. she won the gold in both and she became the reigning national champion for these events so things yeah. are going really really well for Duti mm-hmm. uh, she's at the top of her game she's all set to compete in the 2016 uh, Olympics mm-hmm. she's she's getting like smaller brand deals she's hoping to turn them into much bigger lucrative opportunities for her and mm-hmm. for all of the hard work that she's put in she deserved all of it she did except in 2014 things got very complicated for her. So in June of that year, Duti saw two more victories in the form of gold medals at the 200 meter and the 4 by 400 meter relay events at the Asian Junior Athletics Championship in Taipei. So she was hoping for these wins to get her selected to the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. And at that point, the director of the Sports Authority of India, Gigi Thompson, like she had described Duti as a sure shot Olympic medalist. So it was kind of It was just written in stone for her, hopefully, by this point, right? Mm -hmm. However, about two weeks after she went to Glasgow for the Games, Duti was informed that she had tested positive for unnatural levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, this is a very sensitive subject, and I ask you also to please consider that as we move along. Um, Of course, Duti was dropped from all competition after this happened. So, let's investigate how gender plays into competitive Mm -hmm. sports for a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The answer is, it does not go well at all. So, the thing about gender is, it's a fluid concept. And the thing about biological sex also is not very reliable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Based on your genes, your environment, the food you eat, the lifestyle you live, the amount of estrogen and testosterone that your body may produce can be quite varied. Mm-hmm. In fact, women in particular are susceptible to a condition called hyperandrogenism, which mm-hmm. causes higher levels of androgens in their bodies. That's that's the hormone that develops and monitors the growth of male characteristics in animals, including mm-hmm. humans. Right. About 5% of all women suffer from this condition and it can result in additional conditions like reproductive issues, skin and hair conditions, high cholesterol, So basically, no one asks for this. Uh, No one wants it. But Mm -hmm. some people have it. And Duti Chand had it. Yeah. And sorry, one more thing to just remember. For a chunk of 2015 and 2016, the International Association of Athletics Federation got a lot of shit and rightfully so. Um, They were basically Mm -hmm. accused of sexism and racism by the athletic community for imposing Mm -hmm. some very strict regulations on female athletes specifically. So female athletes had to meet a certain testosterone criteria to compete as women in the events. Mm -hmm. Men, however, had no such condition, which meant that men with a broad range of testosterone levels could all compete in the same events without being stopped. Yeah, in fact, when Duti tested positive, tested in Mm -hmm. like the biggest quotes 
you can possibly put mm-hmm. uh so for high levels of testosterone she said no rules for men but for women there are so many tests to see why is your hormone count so high how much is your body fat how much is your height they check everything but not every human body can be the same mm-hmm. the thing is this is not doping this yeah. is just an entirely different criteria altogether but the indian media being what it is treated this incident like one of doping and effectively maligned and shamed her shanti saundar rajan a track and field athlete from tamil nadu who faced similar issues with a uh, sex based bias said about duti they have tested her at the last minute humiliated her and broken her heart all sorts of things have been written about her now if she re enters the sports field things will not be normal even if she takes treatment people will kill her with their suspicious gaze and they did duti lost her ability to compete which was her life's dream but she was a champ she didn't take it lying down she appealed to the court of arbitration for sport in 2015 and the publicity around her case garnered her enough support and she was able to get a top law firm to represent her at the court without any fees mm-hmm. this this case actually is a landmark one yes actually it is so this case and its results basically sort of changed how the world now sees hyperandrogenism um mm. in july 2015 the ruling found that duti's testing was not related to doping in any manner and it also concluded that testosterone was a natural hormone that varied in levels across different people including different races cuz surprise international competition <laughs> is brings people from across the globe yeah. and they all vary genetically as well so mm. they also said that the international association of athletics federation messed up because they didn't provide enough evidence to prove that testosterone levels could affect an athlete's performance so this was supposed to be you know about why duti would have had an unfair advantage if she had had higher testosterone but the iaf just could never prove that fact at all so like you said this is not a case of doping in which yeah. the strict liability would really apply this is an entirely yeah. different situation and the court was just like dude where is the proof give me <laughs> Yeah so the court gave the IAAF 2 years to provide the evidence to them and in the meantime Duti was cleared to participate in competition again but this particularly irks me because in 2015 Duti gave an interview in which she said the rule is very wrong hyperandrogenism is natural god given we were born this way we have not done anything to our body to change it so what can we do about it how can we change it and honestly my heart broke just like reading this right uh in the same year the iaaf finally changed its regulations about hyperthyroidism but it still puts the onus on the female athlete to prove why she should be allowed to participate mm-hmm. now i'm not saying this is easy to prove but dude hunt all sports about this about oh, who yeah. is the most genetically and physically blessed right of, of course there is like rigorous training and all of that mm-hmm. uh but it it's essentially comes down to do you have what it takes to outcompete the rest that is literally all of sports yeah. so if someone has a biological advantage like being taller or having more muscle mass and that's okay why why is a higher you know natural level of testosterone in a woman's body not allowed to be something that she can capitalize on no that's absolutely accurate it's it's funny that you mentioned that also because michael phelps effectively yes. has webbed feet like he is <laughs> a he duck. is a frog oh that's also correct <laughs> but yeah essentially he is he's genetically blessed with something that gives him that additional you know advantage yeah. most nba players are tall <laughs> oh, you know yeah. just, it is what it is and uh, I don't see why men can capitalize on it including in the same sport the IAF only put those rules for women mm. you know it wasn't even rules for men thankfully things are finally looking up for duti in 2016 after the grueling nonsense that she was put through she got right back to track competitions she won the federation cup national athletics championships in delhi mm-hmm. this was a national record of 11.33 seconds in the 100 meter dash She did however miss the qualifications for the 2016 Olympics which was 11.32 seconds. Oh that's so close. Yeah, it's basically mm. like 1/100 of a second. It's just Oh. Oh, I know, quite frustrating. Mm-hmm. But uh, but she persevered in mm-hmm. 2016. She broke her own previous record by hitting a 11.24 second sprint at the International 
G Kosanav Memorial Games in Kazakhstan and then she did qualify for the Olympics hey sweet yeah mm-hmm. uh when she was told she made it to the olympic team she said i am really happy at the moment it has been a tough year for me and i'm so happy that my coach and my hard work has paid off i would like to thank all the people in india who were praying for me to qualify your wishes have paid off oh that's so sweet and like gracious you know i know especially after how people tore into her that was quite nice uh she didn't make it past the heats at the olympics but the fact that she competed at all th- after the year that she had just what a trooper man yeah yeah 2017 18 were also like good years for her professionally mm-hmm. but in 2019 two major things happened one she came out as queer publicly and stated that she was in a same sex relationship she is quoted as saying that the decriminalization of homosexuality under the indian penal code in 2018 pushed her to talk publicly about her own experiences as a queer athlete mm. this uh, was not taken very well by her family though and she spoke about some frictions that she had had at home mm-hmm. uh, we can only hope that these have been resolved over time and we really do hope uh, the best for her another thing that happened in 2019 she won india's first gold at the world university games in naples italy she mm. would be the first indian woman to do this they and know. soon enough the press was back on her side mm-hmm. so uh, this win also landed her a puma endorsement with a compensation value of about 25 lakhs a year for a two year contract She made appearances at Puma stores, was featured in ads and became a part of their like overall sports brand campaign. Sweet. She was yeah. She was also given custom Puma equipment to help with her training uh, for all of the events. And and this is a huge deal for athletes because they usually have to pay for these things themselves. Uh Puma also put out some very lovely statements about her work and how inspiring she is and I'm just I'm really happy that it ended really well for her. Yeah. I'm really glad as well. This would yeah. be one of those movies where you know you feel good at the end instead of like oh she died yeah. in poverty which is the worst oh, and surprisingly no. we're also ending on a happy note just before a break we never do that it hasn't yes. happened in a while we're always like on that depressing note and then we go <laughs> into the break but you know what on this happy note go take a quick break guys we'll catch you in a minute hey it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network On the Filter Coffee podcast, Karthik speaks with Shreya Sundaresan, co-founder of data-led climate organization Transition Zero. They discuss using data science and financial modeling to fight climate change. It's tough to be a comedian or satirist in India today, but Akash Banerjee is thriving. Check out this year-ender episode of The Wire Talks where he joins Siddharth to sum up 2021. This week on Probation Set Promotion Talk, Abhinav talks about some basic tips to negotiate a good salary. On the longest constitution Priya takes us through the issue of entitlement and reservations at the workplace especially when it comes to caste hierarchies and sexual harassment. On the Habit Coach podcast Ashwin is joined by Sonali Sabarwal. She's a macrobiotic nutritionist and they discuss how vipassana meditation can help us get over stress and deal with other mental health issues. Do follow us on social media where IVM podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, do tell a friend. The word of mouth absolutely is essential to us. Don't forget to rate us on any other platforms that you've been listening to and also I'd like to ask everybody to check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels going. You can find all of them on ivmpodcast.com/youtube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Cred, Bank of Baroda, CoinSwitch, Kuber and Intel. Thank you so much for making this possible. Welcome back after the break everyone. Uh now we are going to get into talking about Nirmala Shiorin who is an Indian track and field sprinter. So Nirmala was born on 15 July 1995 in the Indian state of Haryana in a village called Chehatkot. As a kid she frequently participated in her school's athletic events. Um she studied in a local government school but we I mean we know by this point that they're not very well funded or you know sports isn't really considered a priority for these schools. especially when they you know look for talent and you know develop sporting events and stuff mm. and her family too was not particularly well off they were largely farmers but in the ninth grade nirmala was spotted sprinting by a coach bijendra singh who used to teach girls at the local government senior secondary school which luckily was a better funded school um nirmala's father who luckily knew the coach as well he asked for his daughter to be included in his practice and it worked out but i mean her training was really rough of course she's given a lot of interviews mm-hmm. about how it took a lot out of her and you know especially if she didn't have monetary assistance it yeah. could be really difficult so hats off to her you know for that first of all yeah. and nirmala's hard work 
did lead to great results. Um, in July 2016, at the National Interstate Senior Athletics Championships in Hyderabad, she performed a personal best in the women's 400 meter event, and she clocked with a finishing time of 51.48 seconds. Um, this led her to qualify almost immediately for the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And mm. to be fair, this is also well within the committee's uh, when I say committee, the Olympic committee's. own qualification mark set for the event which was 52.20 seconds and as we you know as we just found out earlier just a mere seconds difference is everything yeah. in track and field events so nirmala did go on to run at the olympics in 2016 for two events the women's 400 meter and the women's 4 by 400 meter relay um she didn't see much success at the olympics that year she was actually eliminated in the heats before the actual events uh, mm-hmm. but closer to home she was actually excelling She had won a double gold medal at the Asian Championship in 2017 in Bhuvaneshwar, uh, one each for the 400 meter race and the other for the 4x400 relay. Hmm. So Nirmala is doing well. Okay, she is riding high on her wins. India is also celebrating her like crazy, and social media is like heavy perform, you know, like praising of her performance and stuff, right? Hmm. But in June 2018, after randomized out of competition testing, Nirmala tested positive for two banned substances in her blood, which are the steroids. Drostin alone and metin alone. Both of these are anabolic steroids, right? Yes. How did you know that? Oh, there's that uh, naming convention that adding that own or at the end of the sentence, it, I mean, at the end of oh. the name, it usually signifies a steroid. That is cool. I did not know that. So yeah, there you go. Something new you learned outside of <laughs> track stuff. But that is cool. So this test basically came up with a positive, and hmm. Nirmala didn't contest the test results. So. The thing huh. is, you know, athletes have the ability to request a hearing and appeal the decision. But reports say that Nirmala accepted the charge. She didn't request a hearing, and she was ready to accept the consequences. So hmm. I think it can mean one of two things, right? Either you know the test was correct, or maybe she didn't care. Actually, no. There's a third one also. It could be that she hmm. didn't have the funds to fight it. That's also possible. Uh, remember earlier when we spoke about Duthi that she had to get a pro yeah. bono lawyer. I remember it was a Canadian mm. firm, if I'm not wrong, and generally they would have charged you a lot of money. But mm. it was a big enough case; it had, you know, larger social implications that somebody volunteered to, you know, contest her case. But mm. it's very likely that Nimila didn't have, you know, the ability to fund those legal costs at all. Damn! I, I mean, if she couldn't contest it because of monetary issues, that just sounds so awful. Yeah. Hmm. Um now this had a major impact on India standing at the Asian Championships mm-hmm. in 2017 India had won 12 golds 5 silvers and 12 bronzes with this decision and the fact that Nirmala was in contesting it meant that India lost two golds that put Vietnam at the top of the medals list for the 400 meters and 4 into 400 relay so India lost a very important footing it was also particularly upsetting since India was the host country and to receive a ban and lose two gold medals as the host country is is kind of humiliating it is and so there are a lot of reports out about this okay and they're kind of really scattered um some mm-hmm. reports say that nirmala actually started doping in 2013 and apparently it was brought to the notice of the international association of athletes federation the iaf um mm-hmm. and the iaf is also signatory to the wada doping code So based mm. on the intelligence that they got they started randomized testing for Nirmala and that's how she ended up with her ban but it's weird that if she really has started doping in 2013 why was her testing conducted so late and yeah. it's also weird because even though so the ban was basically backdated to 29 June 2008 mm. that was the day her test came out as positive but mm. because she competed in other competitions earlier all her results from August 2016 to November 2018 were all disqualified even oh. though As far as I can see, she didn't fail any of those tests prior to that. So basically, any medals she got, any personal time she made, any any laurels whatsoever, all down the drain, you know. And mm. the thing with this case in particular is because she never contested the results, we won't actually ever know what went down. Mm. And in June twenty eighteen, Nirmala did speak publicly about this very briefly, though she mentioned that she was under extreme pressure to compete and perform well. um all while not having necessary funds to keep training and i mean she didn't specifically state that but not being well off was obviously a pain point for mm-hmm. her training progression and it's a vicious cycle athletes have to constantly keep winning to be able to yeah. fund the next training that they have and Correct. she also apparently had typhoid uh, she got the disease a little earlier mm-hmm. in the year and she spoke about how depressed she was in the year prior to this so 
I don't really know how to feel about this case because it's just so upsetting. Yeah, I think I mean I obviously would like to humanize her but I genuinely I don't know as well. There's just not enough information out here on this. That's true I guess. So today Nirmala lives in Rohtak in the Indian state of Haryana mm. with her family. Uh she also passed her BA exams which is a good thing. She was training for the Olympics and passes at the same time and that's not a simple feat. What? Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And she is just 24 years old today which is Damn. so young. She seems to be living a normal life now but we don't know if she misses the track she honestly has not really come out to say anything since you know the, she decided to go away um mm. and if there's any justice in the world i hope someone's able to fund if she wants to contest her finding someone's able to fund right. it some day maybe i don't know so where are we with the doping in athletics today so let's focus on the olympics uh while we talk about this actually so one of the first examples of the olympics having to deal with doping was in 1972 at munich when mm-hmm. rick demont a 16 year old from the us won a gold medal in the men's 400 meter freestyle mm-hmm. he was later tested and found positive for the banned substance ephedrine now ephedrine was a critical component in demont's asthma medication mm-hmm. but his medal was stripped away without regard to the context of how the substance entered his body dude that's so sad particularly cuz yeah. like one in 12 people around the world have asthma and you know their medications are essential to help them live you know yes <laughs> um but he was also banned from competing in the 1500 meter freestyle mm-hmm. and he was at the time the record holder for the event oh the thing is he had actually declared this medication before competing mm-hmm. but the us olympic committee messed up and they didn't get the necessary clearance for him from the international olympic committee oh. and because of this like incredibly stupid red tape Uh, just nonsense there's a child prodigy who is just not allowed to retain his medal oh man even in 2019 after several appeals the uh, ioc just refused to entertain it that's terrible it really is and that was 1972 but fast forward to the 2008 beijing olympics where the official slogan for the games was zero tolerance for doping so out of the 4500 samples that came to the wada six athletes were found positive and they were barred from competing mm-hmm. but in 2016 when some samples were retested it was found that chinese labs in 2008 messed up so badly with the testing that by 2018 after multiple samples were retested at mm-hmm. least 50 olympians medals were stripped for their wins in 2008 What? to which i can say the testing system seems to be flawed as hell yeah As you may know from the movie Icarus that Raghavi so nicely talked about in the beginning <laughs> Russia's involvement in mass doping was caught in time for the 2016 Olympics in Brazil Oh yeah and the 2016 Olympics were a shit show in themselves okay sure <laughs> Russia's actions yeah. impacted it but outside of that also it was kind of trash Yeah it was reported that out of 11470 athletes One third of the whole lot showed no record of being tested in 2016. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> this this also included like inaccurate testing, false negatives, failing to take enough sample. Mm. <laughs> you didn't okay. pee enough into the dump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, failure to coordinate between testing and reporting agencies, and uh, the gold standard of failure, which is incorrect data entry. <laughs> ah, so it just came down to an Excel sheet being wrong. Yes. Yes, correct. That's so. Someone who did not know how to do V lookup and H lookup. <laughs> um, so now the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, they were much more vigilant, mm-hmm. but testing became very difficult because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, they could have just postponed the Olympics. Like, so I know a lot of money went into it. Okay, and 2020 looked very cute in the whole <laughs> symbol and everything. Yes. But dude, by July 2021, some 170,000 people in Japan got COVID. Okay, and the vaccines weren't even fully rolled out yet so it felt a little preemptive and unnecessary yeah well that's i mean that's what happens when you put like thousands of incredibly athletic attractive and young people <laughs> who are at the peak of their physical fitness just like, smush them all together in one <laughs> bubble okay they are definitely going to want to meet up and exchange some bodily fluids with each other <laughs> Actually no you know what Nadri mentioned that's an actual problem with the Olympics okay so when I was reading up for this yeah. I found out that Japan had ordered 160,000 condoms to be distributed at the <laughs> Olympics this year you know cuz young hot people can't keep their hands off each other so 
at least keep them safe it's the least we can do for them yes also the london olympics they mm-hmm. distributed about 350000 condoms mm-hmm. 100000 female condoms mm-hmm. and 175000 packets of lube oh <laughs> Okay there is some dude with a map <laughs> who's like i must pop, like pick up everyone from this um, also the uh, there's this um, lgbtq dating app called grinder their mm-hmm. servers crashed as soon as the athletes landed in the city for the olympics so Ooh. it's just it's always too good to be true you can't even like write stuff like this <laughs> that's true <laughs> so on doping though and let's be fair here okay corruption and cheating are a part of every sport because there's money in sporting in fact yeah. competitive sporting events are not just lucrative they happen to actually be lucrative for a select few people um mm. and fewer even when it's actually just the athletes so which means you have to always be at the top of your game always ready to win and always winning so mm. that effectively means that if you want to live comfortably as a professional athlete you know and considering your best years are within that 2 to 8 year range depending on the sport and presuming mm. you don't injure yourself in any way you have to oh, really yeah. put in a lot of work but sometimes just that work is not enough because there are too many people competing for too few spots which means mm. for a lot of competing athletes especially the ones that are trying to claw their way out of you know particularly bad financial situations and stuff for them they want to have that edge on others and you actively using substances usually gives them that edge so mm. this is this is an issue that's going to be pervasive we're going to be constantly updating that band list yes. it's just never going to change you know and there's also massive corporations funding that level of corruption as recently as 2014 15 fifa which is the world football federation it was investigated mm-hmm. as a part of a series of ethics complaints and that resulted in a 350 page long report it basically said bro fifa is super corrupt okay and they were also accused of accepting bribes from host countries for the 2018 and 2022 world cups yes yeah and the thing is fifa got this report and they refused to publish the report they just published a smaller summary of their own and the folks who conducted the investigation were so pissed off they resigned in protest finally in 2017 fifa was like fine i'll publish the report only after they got oh. so much pressure so it's not just athletes it's governments it's you know world federations that are you know particularly dealing with these athletes so sort of everybody is hand in glove with it and of mm. course there will also always be errors like data entry for one yes. like failing to collect enough p like you said you know so those human errors are always going to happen and it's going to be this weird cesspool so there was this article that i read about how like um there's a the re- latest report published by world anti doping agency that's the wada talking mm. about like doping allegations across the world and india happened to be among the world's top 3 dope violators in the country so this Aha. it's russia italy and then it's us uh, and, yeah we were we were four by the way in 2018 in 2019 oh. we were three we we beat france yes i'm very proud of us of course and that that makes it clear right it's not uh, of course india does clearly have a problem but it's not specifically us either this is not a new issue yeah it's not in fact the, the in fact one of the things that they say is that it's because we are doing increased testings and and i remember one thing that you mentioned as well is that there are more sophisticated ways of doping and yet somehow we got caught with like yeah. the lamest versions of doping yeah maybe that maybe and one of the things that they say in this article is that you know maybe we have so many cases because we're using cheap shit so oh it's possible the others Just- are not getting detected I guess so. So wow, it's again a rich person thing, huh? Comes all comes out mm, to that. Yep. It's systemic, guys. Doping is here yes. to stay and we just have to deal with it. Uh and on that note, Nisha, would you like to take us into a musical recap for this episode? Let's do it. You could be a runner or a track star. Smash the weightlifting bar. That's dope. No joke. Play fair and train hard, 'cause I got you on my radar. Now hope for no dope. Your future is bright if you stay right. Don't take these rules too light. I'll put you away. Don't wander astray. Cause you rule the 
day when your tests will show that's dope I change the rules but you should know that's dope I'll watch you pee into a bowl that's dope and I don't care if you don't know how it got there though because that's dope dude Nisha that was unnaturally funny <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, but uh, you know what? This is not a particularly uh, serious episode, although it should be because you know the lives of young athletes are really impacted. Yeah. Um, yep. But you guys really should go up and read more about this. There are loads of people that we've left out of this mm-hmm. discussion, primarily because it's you know we don't want to put you out for two hours this week. Come on, guys, <laughs> we're not we're not that mean about it. Um, but if you like Nisha said earlier in the episode. If you are an athlete and you face something, you know, similar mm-hmm. or you have an experience that you want to talk about even if you want your name redacted, we're very happy to do that. Um in fact, we might not even want to post it. We would like to learn about it, you know. So, yes. please write to us. We're very happy to hear from you and uh, you know, keep those stories coming. We that really engages us uh quite a bit and we really really enjoy it. Or also of course, please review us on Apple Podcasts and Audible if you get a chance. We'll put the links in our Instagram descriptions. Also, all of the things that we spoke about, all of the sources, all the material will be available in our blog. Um, Raghavi, you mentioned that they can reach out to us. You didn't say how. <gasps> oh no! On Instagram, yes, uh, <laughs> I am at just dot nishful dot thinking. Oh, and I am at ragi dot dosai. And yeah, like Nisha said, look up the blog. You'll find some really incredible sources there. And uh, we're we're looking forward to hearing back from you. And we will see you on the next episode of Misconduct. See you guys. Namaste. This is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says. If you're a cricket fan, check out Edges and Sledges, India's favorite cricket podcast. The podcast focuses on Indian cricket, the IPL, and has a ton of banter both on and off the field. We talk about the week's biggest cricket stories with current and ex international cricketers coaches or sometimes just between us and it's hosted by me DJ me Varun and me Ashwin new episodes release every week you can catch us on the IVM podcast website app or wherever you get your podcasts from check out the edges and sledges cricket podcast